Today, I'm going to be making my best ever pale ale. Hi, I'm Daryl Smith. I'm a home brewer in the UK. And on this channel, I share with you my experiences of being a home brewer. So on my ongoing journey to become a better home brewer, I've been trying to dial down my pale ales. I feel like it's the style that I've had the least success with in the past. Um, you know, some of my darker beers have been fab, but I feel like I've never made a truly incredible pale ale. I think part of this is because of um, my water profiles that I've used in the past and also the pH that I've been mashing at. If you watch any of my uh, last few videos you've seen that I've been trying to get better at water control, most specifically controlling the pH of the brew. So in this video I'm making a relatively simple pale ale, not using too many different types of malt and only using two different hops. I'm using um, quite a common combination which is Centennial and Simcoe, they go together really well and lots of popular commercial beers actually use this combination. I've also noticed that I've recently not done any beers where I dry hop it for various reasons. Um, mo most notably being that I've been so busy recently in my personal life and work, I'm sorry. So I've not been able to know definitely when I was gonna bottle and so dry hopping has been an issue to me because I didn't want to accidentally ruin my beer by having a long dry hop. Um, but this time round, I knew when I'd be able to bottle the beer. I also tried out a really great and interesting technique for doing a dry hop quickly and easily without having to open your fermenter. So the technique that I'm using in this video is where you use food grade magnets. Now I've seen in other videos um, Americans using much larger magnets than what I've got, but I cannot find anywhere in the UK that is selling the big ones that are being sold in America. I think sous vides aren't as popular in the UK as they are in America and so no one's bothering to make the large food grade magnets that you need for them in the UK. But I did find these, these are neodymium magnets which are food grade. They are very powerful actually, they're strong enough for me to um, use them. A link to them will be in the description of the video. You put your hops into a mesh bag, a food grade one of course, tie it up with half of your magnets inside of it. You can also stick some marbles in there to help weigh it down. And then what happens is that you've got the magnets inside your food grade bag. You put them inside here and then you see your fermenting bucket, you've got magnets holding the other magnets and so you've got your hops ready to be dropped in later because obviously when you release this the magnet drops. You'll see later in this video that I fell into a slight issue where I accidentally filled my fermenter up with too much wort before trying to do the hop drop. But you'll see later that that wasn't really an issue and um, I still got a great beer out of it. So now you know all of that, let's get to brewing it. As always, the first thing I did was to put 31 litres of water into the kettle and then add half a Campton tablet. I left this for 30 minutes to extract the chlorine from the water. I then started heating the water up to my target temperature of 71 degrees. I then prepared my water using the water profile that the apartment brewer gave for one of his previous pale ales. Beer Smith Free worked out that this required me to add table salt and Epsom salt to my water. For this brew day, I wanted to try out altering the water's pH before beginning the mash process so to save time and maximise efficiency. But I couldn't find my syringe. This resulted in me making a massive error. <laughs> I thought I could eyeball the amount of lactic acid I needed to get to my target pH of 5.6. I could not. At first this worked fine and I got to a pH of 6.7. However, I then accidentally glugged too much lactic acid into the water, resulting in the super low pH of 4. 
So after some frantic googling, I tried raising the pH and discovered that apparently calcium can increase the water pH, so I then crushed some of that up and added it to my water, which made the water fizz and did absolutely nothing to the pH. At this point, I had messed up my water so much that I could not confidently alter it anymore and so just got rid of it. Unfortunately, I had plans for the evening of this brew day and had already wasted so much time messing about that I had to just give up and wait until the next day to go at it again. So yet again, I prepared my water with a Kempton tablet, table salt and Epsom salt and began heating it up. I then checked my pH and started adding lactic acid with the syringe I refound. I added it slowly, a few mils at a time before testing it with my pH meter until I hit my target pH of 5.6. Well, 5.5, but that was very close. I could actually get further into the process this time and so I weighed out my grains. For this recipe I used 4 kilograms of Maris Otter as the base malt, 466 grams of Vienna malt for flavour, 347 grams of Amber malt to add a biscuity flavour and to darken the beer, and finally 200 grams of flaked barley for body. I still had a little bit more time before the water had hit temp, so I prepared my hop additions. The first was 15 grams of Centennial for the start of the 30 minute boil, 12 grams of Centennial for 20 minutes before the end, 8 grams of Centennial and 4 grams of Simcoe for halfway through, 8 grams of both Centennial and Simcoe for the 10 minute edition, and 40 grams of Simcoe and 20 grams of Centennial for a big hop stand at the end of the boil. I also later added 40 grams of Centennial as a dry hop, but I prepared that later. The full recipe is in the description. And if you're enjoying this video, then please do give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And let me know what technique for dry hopping have you found gives you the best results. Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and grains, stirring regularly to stop clumping. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of 65 degrees C. During the hour-long mash, I stirred the grains and checked the temperature every 15 minutes, putting the burners on for a few minutes and stirring to stop scorching when the temperature dropped too low. This was the first outing for my giant whisk, which I found at a charity shop. I was jealous of Michael Keane of the Home Brew Challenge and I was so thrilled to find this for just £1.50. Once the overall mash time had got to an hour, I then began the process of mashing out the grains. In this process, you heat up the mash to 77 degrees C for 10 minutes so to denature the enzymes and stop them converting sugars. After that was done, I then drained the grain bag, squeezed it and left it to drip for 15 minutes whilst I got the wort boiling. I did not pour hot kettle water over the grain bag this time as I didn't want to alter the water's profile or mash pH. On reflection, what I should have actually have done is taken some of the water out of my kettle before starting the mash. Once the wort was rolling, it was time to start my 30 minute boil and add my first 15 gram hop addition. I then began the hop schedule I mentioned earlier. I tried not using a hop spider as I'm concerned that some of my beers have not been as hoppy as expected because of it. At 15 minutes I added my copper cooling coil so to sanitise it and at 10 minutes before the end I added yeast nutrient. At the end of the boil I added my hops and immediately began cooling the wort, stirring it so to help cool it quicker. Once it got to 85 degrees I then began a 15 minute hop stand. After that was done I then cooled the wort to 40 degrees celsius and added it to the fermenter, allowing some splashing so to help add oxygen. I then prepared my muslin bag and magnets for the dry hop. Look, I didn't get much footage of this because just before I did it, my house's boiler broke and then I had to completely rush filming at the end because I was very stressed. So anyway, that dry hop was 40 grams of Centennial. I realised at this point that I had not left enough space between the hop bag and the fermenting beer. And so what happened is that I basically started dry hopping immediately. I later found out that this is a process called a 
dip pop and can have great results, which was lucky for me. So finally, it was time for me to add Lutri yeast. It took less than 24 hours before a healthy fermentation kicked in. And at this point, I released the magnet hops, but they were already dry hopping at this point. So I didn't really need to do that. <laughs> Just seven days after that, it was time to bottle the beer. Apart from my boiler breaking down, that was a really fun brew day. I'm happy to announce that my boiler got repaired. I want to thank um, the plumbing company Abacus in Malmesbury. They've not sponsored this video. Of course they haven't. They're a small independent company who uh, most of my audience will not benefit from the uh, help of. But they're a fantastic plumbing company and they did fix my boiler. So I bottled after seven days. So as you saw, I accidentally did something called a dip hop, which actually was really interesting to do. A, you know, a different way of dry hopping beer. And because it was Kvike yeast, I was able to bottle within seven days. So it didn't have a detrimental effect on my beer in the end. Now, a big thing that I do have to point out is that this beer did end up being 3.9%. It was meant to be about five. Now, I think this was because I didn't pour any water over my grain bag. This is because I didn't want to pour any kettle water over it after I'd worked so hard to get the right water profile. In retrospect, what I should have done is grabbed some water out of my um, brewing vessel, which had been treated, before I had started the mash, that would have made much more sense and then poured that over. I have no way of recirculating my mash, so I can't do, you know, recirculating methods. But I don't think it's affected the quality of the beer, it's just, you know, not as strong as I was expecting it to be. I get asked about it often, and there is a link in the description to uh, the paint pens that I use for my bottles. My fiance, Charlotte, um, is the one who writes this beautiful art on it, um, because I have such terrible handwriting that she is forced into writing for me. Anyway, let's um, open this bottle. So I feel like that's turned out how I wanted. It's not super, super clear. It's clearer than I was expecting it to be, to be completely honest. I, you know, I wanted a little bit of a haze. I wanted just that, that natural look that a lot of uh, modern beers um, have. More and more breweries aren't using um, finings or any other method to clear the beer. So I wanted to have a go at doing that, you know, not use Irish moss or anything. And I think this is still a very attractive beer. So yeah, a lovely golden color, like a golden dark color. I think the Marisotta and the Amber Malt are giving most of the color. Um, a bit of that haze is probably also from um, the flaked barley that I used in there. Nowhere near as hazy as I was expecting, but this wasn't going to be a hazy beer. I just didn't want to use Irish moss in it. I wanted it to look like a modern beer. Smell wise, so smell wise, I think I'm getting a bit of a, like a piney grapefruit. Definitely that dry hop centennial that's giving a lot of that aroma. That's probably the best aroma that I've ever had from any of my beers. And I feel like that's probably because of me actually finally getting my pH control correct. And also the dry hop, of course, you know, it's my first large dry hop that I've done uh, for ages, I forget how much of an impact um, a good dry hop can actually have on a beer's aroma. So let's give it a taste. Plenty of pine and grapefruit in that flavor. What I'm really noticing as well is the improved mouthfeel compared to my other beers. It feels much more of a, a like a full taste. What, what I'm finding interesting is that despite it being relatively low ABV, you know, 3.9, it still feels like thicker in the mouth. I think that's probably the flaked barley doing some of the work there, but also could be that uh, water profile, which um, I feel like is having a big impact on this. Definitely on the, the lingering aroma. There's no like metally taste or anything like that. This definitely feels like the best water profile that I've used um, for my home tap water and really does prove that I can make a decent pale ale without having to use reverse osmosis or anything like that. Yeah, it comes in first with that pine hit, and then uh, you've got that like citrusy grapefruity taste. 
it's very drinkable. <laughs> I'm working my way through that <laughs> nicely. Uh, I didn't realize how much I quickly drank. Uh, yeah, that's, that's lovely. Uh, I feel like I keep saying this at the moment, but uh, honestly, it's true. This is the best beer that I've ever made. Um, I think my discovery of Lutri yeast is really helping. Uh, you know I love <laughs> Kvike yeast on this channel if you've watched even one of my videos. And uh, Lutra is really doing some amazing stuff for me at the moment. I'm not getting any of the yeast character. I really am just getting hops and malt. There's a bit of a biscuitiness that's coming from the Marisotta and the um, Amber Malt. Although I'll probably endlessly be tweaking my Pale Ale malt bill, I'm really, really happy with how that one turned out. It's worked really well with these hops. I feel like my next brew day, I'm tempted to brew almost the same thing again, but with just a few tweaks. As yeah, I feel like I'm really dialing down a good beer to drink over the spring and the summer. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, it means a lot. If you've enjoyed it, then please like and subscribe to the channel. And let me know in the comments what combination of just two hops has resulted in your favorite ever beer. I really think that Simcoe and Cascade clearly work really well together. If I was doing this again, I would do even more of a dry hop, you know, go bigger, but I wouldn't have made it any bit more bitter. I think the bitterness is perfect for this beer. But yeah, maybe if I just went double the dry hop, maybe even did Simcoe as well as Cascade as um, a dry hop, it could have uh, been really interesting. But then again, this is lovely, easy drinking. Maybe I don't need to break what isn't already fixed. Is that the phrase? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.